Praveen Mohan is known worldwide for his research into the symbology of ancient temples around the world. His archaeological and spiritual quest has taken him to Peru, Indonesia, but focuses chiefly on the ancient treasures to be found in India. He has guested on History Channel's Ancient Aliens and has built his own platform to some 4 million subscribers across four languages. Before we get into today's content, on behalf of the Fifth Kind TV, I want to say a big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's content. Surfshark is a VPN that allows us all to become citizens of the world through online access. If you're like me, you'll enjoy watching online content from countries all around the world. But I live in Australia, and what I'm shown in internet searches will be different to what you're shown in Canada, America, the Philippines, Germany, the Netherlands, wherever you're watching from. By using Surfshark, I'm able to access a world of online content and see all the things that you see and many other things beside. Surfshark enables us to become citizens of the world through online availability. Get fully protected. Follow the link in the description, sign up and use the promo code fifth kind to receive an 85% discount. Plus, you'll get three months for free. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you try it and you don't like it, you can easily cancel your subscription and receive a full refund. With Surfshark, you can swim under the radar in the sea of online content. You mentioned earlier your trip to Indonesia, which was quite recent. And while you were there, you went to the Chandi Suku Temple, which is an extraordinary place. And my yeah. jaw dropped when I saw you walk around this place because it really is an anomaly. It portrays long-skulled people, such as you might find in ancient Peru, the Paracas skulls, or in Egypt with the way some of the pharaohs were portrayed. Uh, with the false beard that was Egyptian fashion as well. You've got a portrayal of the Ark of the Covenant, it looks like, which is the Hebrew tradition, Hebrew scriptures. You've got a Mayan-style pyramid. I mean, it looks like a, like a religious Disneyland, that it seems to be a you know, theme park of world thought and world religion. That's a lot of cultural knowledge in one place, and I was interested to know, what is the date of that place for that knowledge all to have come together? Does it reflect an ancient global culture or was this simply put together by someone who is very well traveled? What, what do you make of it? It's an extraordinary place. What do you make of it? So there is an interesting story about the Chandi Suku Temple because uh, before I went to Indonesia, I checked with David Childress and we have all these great temples in these big cities like Yogyakarta. But David Childress is like, no, 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 don't go to these uh, touristic temples. Go to the site called Chandi Suku and then tell me what you think, right? Because he has already researched about Chandi Suku. So I went to Chandi Suku and it's a very difficult place to reach. It's on a place, uh, it's on kind of like a mountainous area and the roads are really narrow. So when we went to the Chandi Suku temple, uh, our jaws were just dropping on the floor because uh, this temple in a remote part of Indonesia has a pyramid, okay? And this pyramid looks very much like uh, the Mayan pyramid of Chichen Itza. Now, the thing is, is it related to the Mayans? But when we look at the carvings, we look at carvings that are very similar to Hindu carvings as well, because we can see gods like Ganesha there, the elephant god there. So it looks mm -hmm. very similar to the Hindu gods as well. And then more interestingly, like when I started to really look at the carvings, I realized that their heads were not normal, okay? They, they had real elongated skulls. And we're not talking about just one or two statues. We're talking about like dozens and dozens of carvings which really had like elongated skulls. 
there you know there is a lot of controversy about these elongated skulls some people say okay so they were just doing head binding because some tribes do head binding and they're able to kind of like modify the skull but i mm. found one more detail that was that completely nails this because these are not humans they had holes outside of their earlobe they had one near the temple here and then they had one behind the earlobe and we're not again we're not talking about one carving we can see the same detail in all the carvings these carvings are shown with elongated skulls and the sculptors i mean this is where it's really interesting right the sculptors wanted to tell us that this species had this detail that was yes. that's yes. not present in humans so which is why they painstakingly put these holes outside the ears so this clearly proves that these were not humans and the carving show like really interesting details you can see signs of torture there was some conflict going between them um and so, another very interesting thing i don't know if i can say this in in your channel um i mean i certainly got in trouble for saying it in my channel they demonetized some of my videos we, we um, can edit it for youtube probably don't <laughs> cool but i know some of some of your uh, uh, patrons may be watching on your on your website now another key detail these are anatomical details we're talking about right so yes. for example if if there was a man walking with like five eyes you're not going to be like okay he's just human because you, humans don't get to have like five eyes right so uh, this uh, detail of like elongated head uh, elongated skull and then these holes you know uh, up and down the earlobe on top of this there are several carvings shown with four testicles it's a remarkable detail it's clearly shown not just in, again not mm -hmm. just in one carving they're showing it again and again in these carvings which means that we're clearly looking at a species that's not human yes and these beings that you're describing with um the reptilian style face the elongated skull the hole in the skull above the ear they are the power people uh, depicted here and they're in power over the humans and so the sixty-four thousand dollar question is are these extraterrestrials and uh, were they governing over our ancestors in the deep past is that the story we're being told i certainly think so i certainly think that um once upon a time uh, extraterrestrials came to our planet and just like what Elon Musk is planning to do you know 20 years from now they came to earth and I mean I just visualized the scenario of uh, what would happen if Elon Musk goes to a distant planet let's say we call it planet X and then there are like cave men living there right so Elon Musk will just land in in that planet x he'll just have everything right so if they come to attack him he'll just use a laser gun and kill them um he can make he can just click the lighter and make fire right and and the caveman will just think of him as a god the caveman will be like okay how is this guy able to just take something out of his pocket and eat it right we have to fish and we have to go hunting for like a whole day to find food how is he able to do it how is he able to make fire with just clicking his hand? How is he able, able to just kill a person by just pulling a trigger, right? So to those people, he's going to just look like a god. And this is exactly what I think happened many thousands of years ago. And I, and I think uh, people would have observed these extraterrestrials or gods coming and landing on our planet. Yes. I mean, that story echoes in ancestral stories all around the world. You can hear it in the ancient Mesopotamian stories. It's mm -hmm. buried there in the stories of the Bible. You go to African story in, in Nigeria, Nigeria, listen to the Yoruba people, the Edo people, the Epic people. They all have a version 
of this story. And for me, it's the correlations that, that make me take it really seriously. I think we were visited. I think we were adapted in the deep past. And in some of the other temples you visited, you found stories of that seem to represent uh, people being engineered artificially. Uh, we talked about the, um, the gestation pod, for instance, that you found in one temple. Is it a yes. kumba, it's called? Yes, it's called a kumba, yes. Yes, we do. Um, there's a lot of uh, carvings uh, in Hindu temples that show evidences of very advanced like medical technology. For example, in many Hindu temples, you will see a sperm swimming towards the egg or ovum, and it's just getting ready to, uh, you know, to go into it, right, and make a zygote and start life. This is very popular carving, and you can see this in many ancient Hindu temples, more than a thousand years old, okay? And it, these carvings should not be there because uh, we did not invent the microscope until the last 500 years. We, we're not supposed to see these single cell organisms, right? But we do see them. And we also see cell division. These, uh, these carvings show step by step how one cell divides into two and then becomes into four. We're literally able to go from pillar to pillar looking at how a single cell transforms into a big organism, okay? And it's really interesting because why do we see these carvings, right? If we see these carvings in, let's say, Egypt or Greece, we may not be able to understand that fully. But when we look at ancient Indian texts, these texts talk about test tube babies. These texts talk about how um, in ancient times, they were making babies outside the human body. Okay, this is called drona. So the test tubes were called something like dronas and they could do it outside the body. They could literally um, do this kind of in vitro fertilization. We could Today we do this in a petri dish, right? So we take the, the sperm and the ovum and then we artificially do it. And this technology was talked about in ancient times and then, but today we don't have these gestation pods yet. Okay, so typically what happens today is you'll have IVF or in vitro fertilization. And then after, you know, the, the cell starts, the, the zygote starts developing to a certain level, you go and put it back into the woman's womb. That's how we do it, right? But ancient Indian texts have taken it like one step further. They talk about, uh, a gestation pod that's built completely outside. So mm -hmm. the woman doesn't have to do anything. So the baby completely goes inside the, uh, grows inside the gestation pod. And they talk about how to provide nutrition to the fetus. Okay, so you, you think about that. So they talk about like how we maintain the kumba. So how are we supposed to maintain the temperature? Like how, what kind of nutrition goes into this kumba? Okay, now we have not completely achieved this yet. But since this is going to be on YouTube, this is what, 2024? I will bet you in 50 years, let's say 2075, there's going to be a lot of people who are using external gestation pods. A lot of people uh, are not able to hold the baby. They're not, their wombs are not strong enough. And they're all going to move towards these gestation pods. And 100 years from now, a woman who actually delivers a baby naturally is going to, you know, be the headline in newspapers because people even today even having like a normal delivery like not doing a c-section is becoming really rare so in 50 years and 100 years people completely move towards these external gestation pods and think about it is it just a coincidence is it just fantasy that 
ancient Indian texts were mentioning the exact same technology? Absolutely not. I think such kind of technology definitely existed in ancient times. And we have carvings that support this. And we also have texts that support this. So Praveen, what's the age of the texts that talk about these technologies? Um, we're talking, for example, the text of Ramayana, at least 2,000 years old. Okay. And when they at talk least. about these technologies, is it your view that it's describing the technology of the, of the gods, so to speak, of the extraterrestrial visitors, or, or was it human technology at that time that's since been lost? It's, this is a good question, which I don't know the answer to yet. So uh, a part of the confusion is in understanding, okay, which one is a god and which one is a human? Because they, at some point, they become really intertwined. Yes. We don't know who is human and who is god. And they talk about a civilization that kind of blends both of them together. And yes. hence the arrival of Nephilim or giants. In, of course. Yeah, in With Indian texts, they clearly mention the giants. Yes. And what's interesting is that they're always shown as a hybrid between humans and gods. Exactly. Yes, you find the same in the Bible, in Genesis 6. You find the same in the Sumerian story. Gilgamesh, of course, was uh, a giant. And it is the result of hybridization. And the fact that that story repeats around the world, for me, that's a bit of a smoking gun. But in terms of distinguishing human from gods, there is a kind of entity that gets mentioned around the world that is described in very distinct physical terms as being reptilian and feathered. So you've got the feathered serpents of Mesoamerica. You have feathered serpents in the in the biblical story, feathered serpents exist in China. Can you tell me how do the Serpa and the Nagas fit into that picture in the world of Hinduism? There's a lot of material about uh, Sarpa, which is obviously uh, related to the word Seraph. Yes. And then uh, serpent. And serpent. And yeah, and they're all coming from the same root. That's really obvious. Um, they're more commonly known as Nagas in India. And um, the thing is, these Nagas live underground. According to ancient Hindu texts, these Nagas live in like a subterranean world. And these Nagas are... Uh, still considered very powerful gods. Uh, there's a lot of people who worship these serpentine gods. We have a lot of people who claim that they're descendants of these serpentine gods. Um, a lot of people say, okay, so um, I'm only partly human. The other part of me, my like my great, 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 great grandfather was a Naga. Um, the classic example, we have certain tribes called Nagas in India and Sri Lanka as well, who claim that they, they are descendants of these Nagas. Um, in Cambodia, if you uh, just go to Wikipedia and see the origin of Cambodian civilization, the very first queen mentioned is actually not human. She's a Naga. She uh, comes from somewhere and she actually founds that civilization that transforms humanity. So we do have some strong evidence that Nagas were these reptilian beings, um, very powerful, and they're able to do things like shape-shifting, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. They're able to uh, transform and uh, create illusions. They're capable of flight and they usually live underground. And Nagas are also credited with building many megalithic structures. Uh, people do worship, a lot of people worship Nagas 
in especially in South India, it's very common because uh, they believe that the Nagas are listening to us when we're talking. Um, the Nagas are always listening to us, and they can they can help us if we ask them. I find it fascinating how strongly that correlates with stories around the world. The origins of the kings, for instance, so many cultures claim that the authority of their kings was derived from the non-human kings who preceded them. That's even built into the story of the British royal family. If you research the Stone of Scone, for instance, the Stone of Destiny. Uh, so it's a really universal story. It's fascinating. But um, there was something else I was going to ask you about that that slipped my mind. It might come back to me in a minute. Uh, so while I'm waiting to remember that, I'll ask you something else. On a lighter note, uh, if you go to ancient Armenia, lower Mesopotamia, Bolivia, Ecuador, you will find gods wandering around with a handbag. And uh, people speculate as to why they're all carrying this same handbag, what is in it. And uh, what I've heard from you is really interesting because you found some carvings in India that are not quite handbags, but might give us an insight as to what could have been in the mystery object. What are your thoughts on that, Praveen? Okay, so, um, I mean, the, like you said, you know, we find these handbags in uh, places like Armenia, especially in Sumerian carvings, you always find these gods holding a handbag. Uh, there are a couple of places where I found this handbag in India. And the first one is a place called Gangai Kunda Cholaburam. And that handbag is kind of like put up on a tree branch. It's just hanging from a tree branch there. Um, somehow the carvings I've seen, they, I've never seen a handbag placed on the ground. Which seems to be very odd to me, okay? Which uh, seems to uh, imply that it's some kind of a power source, right? But we normally don't put until the last 30, 40 years ago, we were not allowed to put batteries, like a big, like a car battery, for example, we're not allowed to put it on the ground because it just starts to drain quicker because mm -hmm. of the earth, um, which makes me wonder if it's some type of a power source. There is another um, temple called Avriya Temple, which uh, sh showed more than a couple of handbags. It's very interesting because... Uh, only, I believe, this is the only place, uh, only this temple called the Avriya Temple shows the handbag open. Okay, we can actually see what's inside the handbag. Okay, but again, this is kind of a bummer because inside the handbag, there seems to be like more containers. <laughs> okay, yes. there's like two bottles. <laughs> there are like two bottles in there with, where we seem to have the lids intact. There are two bottles and there's like an arc like instrument there. Um, so we don't know what they are. Like now we start to move from like what's in the handbag to like what's in the bottle. Yeah, what's in the jar. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, but they did use the handbags and it's interesting because they clearly show right these these guys are shown in the in the middle of a battlefield. Okay. That's and right. Think, That's right. I'd forgotten that detail. And that's what's interesting, right? So if, if you're going into a battlefield, you're not going to be like, okay, I'm just going to take a, a, a bottle of like apple juice, right? You won't do that. You're going in there with only the most important stuff, right? Because it's a battlefield, right? You're not going to be like, okay, let me just take like a Snicker bar or like some chocolate bar or something like that. So you're going to take only the important stuff. And he's taking that handbag and inside that handbag, he has two containers, and like an arc-like thing. Um, of course, that I haven't solved that mystery because I, now I have to go and look for the carving, see what's inside that yes, jar. Yes, in the jar. <laughs> All right. Raveen, I will ask you again in another year or so and see if you've found out more on that. People want to know. Uh, now, I want to come back to the spiritual aspect of your quest because... One of the things I love about what you're doing is that it's not information just for information's sake. It's part of a much deeper quest for you. And I know that you've sat 
and studied at the feet of masters of siddhas and sadhus, and you've seen some things. And so I want to ask you about that bigger journey you've been making and ask from all the things you've seen uh, in temples and from sitting at the feet of masters, have your beliefs changed? Have your beliefs about human beings changed and, and what's possible for us? Um, I believe that we haven't fully understood ourselves and um, we've just gone like really far away from our initial quest, which is mastery of self, uh, which is reaching enlightenment. Um, which is achieving eternal peace. I think we're moving more and more towards more conflict. Um, people have become more evil. Again, this is all mentioned in ancient texts. This is called the Kali Yuga uh, in ancient Hindu texts, where people start to uh, become more and more evil um, rather than understand their uh, problems and try to solve them. Um, achieve happiness and I have gone to like really remote places I've yeah I worked with a lot of siddhas or these uh, masters and they seem to have transcended all these little things they don't care about all these uh, petty matters they they are quite devoid of uh, anger or fear or, you know, the, the, the worries. You know something has happened in the past and it still bogs you down every day. And you're going to carry that for the rest of your life. And these masters uh, don't have any of that. And uh, they're able to achieve this kind of a mental uh, state uh, mm -hmm. through meditation uh, and mostly they live reclusive lives uh, I do and this is why you don't see me sometimes you see I don't make a video for like two months I'm just gone um, mm -hmm. because I'm in a completely remote place where we're not allowed to have cell phones uh, there will be no connectivity um, and we're doing um, you know we're doing certain rituals to uh kind of enhance your mental state. So we do a lot of that. A lot of th this is also done in secrecy. Uh, we're not supposed to talk about this, but we do recreate ancient rituals. The ancient people around the world, not just in India, the ancient people around the world uh, were much, much happier. And um, they had tranquility. And uh, we somehow seem to have uh, lost all that. I don't think human beings are supposed to have that kind of, this level of conflict yes. is just uh, insane, I think. I think, and um, um, it's good because, I mean, luckily I found, uh, you know, this this as my passion, going to the temples, uh, working with all these people who are quite spiritual. So it, it does bring me a lot of happiness. It's definitely brought me uh, peace. I was able to <laughs> definitely get rid of uh, all the negative emotions. I don't hold, uh, you know, these silly grudges or like worries and all that stuff. Um, this is definitely brought on by um, these sites and these people I work with. Now, a lot of people listening will say, uh, I love the sound of that. And I certainly need to de-stress myself and to move away from heavier emotions, as Plato called them, and get rid of all my wounds and resentments and anguish and unforgiveness. But I have three kids to look after. I have a job to maintain. I would love to go away for two months and uh, meditate and sit at the feet of a master. But what can I do? in my mainstream employed life that can begin to move in the direction that Praveen is describing? Well, I don't have an answer to that. I, I should be selfish and say, watch Praveen Mohan channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good um, advice. That is good advice. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the thing is, um, um, what we do, we do a lot of stuff, but it's really intense. A lot of people um, come to me and say, okay, what are, what are you selling right now? Are you, can you take us on like a spiritual tour for like a week and we'll pay you big bucks? Uh, we don't run tours like that. Uh, uh, it's a big industry, as you may as well know. Uh, a lot of my friends, uh, Hugh Newman, who I met um, last week, he was in India. Um, he also does tours like that. A lot of this is uh, also connected with spirituality. Um, mm. They'll be sitting together in, a, in an ancient temple chanting a mantra, and then they'll go to like a yoga retreat for one day. And they completely, it does work. It, it does de-stress you. Um, but unfortunately, I'm just too dumb for all that. I'm just going to, <laughs> I, I'm I, like, I, you know, the thing is I haven't um, um, made any money out of this. I'm just going to the temples, mostly because I don't think, um, if I wanted to make a ton of money, I would just go back to the United States, you know, make mm. it. It's not a big deal for me, but I think I'm trying to crack the code of yes. what it is. There is still a lot of missing pieces in the puzzle that we're not understanding. I think only in yes. the last 10 years, I've kind of scratched the surface of all these carvings, these texts. But I believe if I do it for another five or 10 years, we may be able to make a significant step forward in really understanding what it is. Yes. Yes. Well, Praveen, I think you're making this journey on a lot of people's behalf and uh, I'm watching with bated breath as you continue. If I were to save up and be able to come over to India and say, Praveen, take me to the one temple that you think is going to be most mind-blowing for me. Where would you take me? What would you show me? I would take you to this temple, which we only found out last week. Uh, this is a temple called Mandagapattu. Um, this is a cave temple. This is the oldest monolithic cave temple built in southern India. This is about 1,400 years ago. The specialty of this temple is that it's built with a negative construction technique. Now, what's a negative construction technique, right? So when we talk about constructing a temple, when we talk about constructing a temple, sorry, when we talk about constructing a temple or a house, or an office, what do you think about, right? So you start from the ground level and you start adding materials to it and then you construct the structure. Now, this is the positive construction technique, but this temple at Mandagapattu was built with a negative construction technique, meaning that nothing was added to it to create this temple. There was this giant rock, it looks almost like a giant hill, and then the architect did not add anything, but just started to scoop the granite out of this giant rock. Okay, he must have scooped tons and tons of rocks. And then he, what you're looking at is created because of the removal of materials. And what he has done is very strange. He has not put any statues there. There's nothing inside. The, the three chambers are completely empty, okay? But there is an inscription that says this temple is dedicated to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. It does mention three gods, the three main gods of Hinduism, but the chambers are actually empty. So which makes us wonder, are these statues invisible? Because we don't see any sign of destruction there. We, it doesn't mm. appear that these statues were destroyed. The inscription says there are three statues, but there are no statues there. So it seems very interesting to me because this temple was built with negative construction technique. And then it has these invisible chamber, invisible statues in these chambers. And then another really important detail is that 
The inscription says nothing is added to this, okay? And this is a key part of the inscription. But you can see these slots on these chambers for doors, okay? Mm. So the doors must have been put there. But according to the inscription, you cannot add anything, right? So that door must have also been like a megalithic door carved out of the bedrock. It's it's just mind boggling to me if that's even possible. Okay. I don't know if you if you went to like Coral Castle in Florida. Did you? No, I haven't seen that place. But okay. uh, yeah, I, you, you wrote, I wrote about a, this, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I wrote a book about it. It's a, it's a good one. And and I think we taught there he built two doors. Uh one was a nine ton door, the another one was like a three ton door. Uh, made out of rock. Uh, the three-ton door still works. If you go to Coral Castle, you can still like move it. Okay, so the nine-ton door doesn't. So because it, it's it's kind of jammed. But the thing is, um, at least we know that that's possible, right? So we can see yes. that that's possible. Yes. It and we have in a yeah in a place called Chennakeshwar Temple, you can see a rotating pillar. It's a giant pillar. It's a giant pillar weighing tons. And this is a rotating pillar. And now we can see more. There's an entire lingam which you can rotate in India. And we're all we're talking about ancient temples here. So this kind of building megalithic doors, like movable parts, is like really interesting to me, mm. uh, which makes me wonder if Mandagapattu had this kind of technology, right? He, they must have had these stone doors right moving stone doors made out of the same rock so mandagapattu is a very interesting site I'll, I'll leave some of this um kind of unsaid but it's also like a hanging temple it's not started from the top and also not started from the bottom so there are only two ways you can make a monolithic temple you cannot build it in, in any other way so one way is you start from the top of the mountain and you go inside, and it, this is called cut out rock technology. Yes. Okay, this is found in um, Kailasa Temple in Elora Caves. Uh, this is found in Betuan Kovil in um, Tamil Nadu. There's one more rock cutting technique where you find a giant rock and you start going like this from the ground level. Okay, then you, you make it into like a nice temple. Okay, but the Mandagabattu Temple. What's strange is that these guys didn't start from the top and they also did not start from the bottom. They, somehow they started like maybe like eight feet from the ground level. So how did they even do that, right? Were they like kind of hanging and, and carving this? Like we don't understand. And this is an extraordinary uh, temple uh, which uh, Hugh and I just visited uh, like a week ago. Wonderful. Well, Praveen, you've got me saving up for that trip. You you whetted my appetite. What kind of, um, are you getting pushback from people in India for the work that you're doing or is it all encouragement? We won't, I mean, definitely not, right? If, uh, if 100% of Indians or 100% of the people around the world were encouraging me, then I'm definitely doing something wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I should be like selling ice cream or something like that, right? <laughs> right? I mean, the, the, yeah, the, this is actually how I, I, I estimate um, how uh, powerful the content is. If I, if I yes. don't get any criticism for like six months, then I actually stop and say, okay, I'm doing something wrong. Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> because I, I am supposed. To that. <laughs> yeah. I, I can mean, relate that, to that for sure. <laughs> absolutely right. So we are we are going to do that, right? We are all going to face this kind of criticism because the mainstream media, the mainstream narrative, it's it's it it's so like rampant, and it also has such deep foundation. So in case of anything, right? So I don't know if you heard of like William Harvey, right? There was this guy called William Harvey. Uh, this is a doctor who uh, found out 
that the heart pumps blood to the human body, right? And he had to go to great lengths to prove this, right? So he found a p- person who was uh, uh, dying in an accident, and then he had to like cut open the body and show that the heart was pumping out blood. But guess what? All the doctors who lived around his time refused to accept it, right? Because if they accepted it, they had to throw away all the books and all the procedures and everything that they were following until then, right? So whenever we come with something new, you're always going to see a lot of criticism. And then this is exactly what we should be doing, right? We have like, Tony was telling me that, you know, we're talking about UFO stuff. Same thing happened with us when we were doing the UFO stuff in the U.S. In the U.S., the great thing is like every town has like a UFO society and we'd go and be a part of that society. And then we talk about the UFO stuff. And when we posted this UFO materials to places like Facebook, they would delete our content. They would think that, okay, this is a conspiracy theory. This is not real, right? But today, mm-hmm. this UFO stuff is considered real. All the governments are starting to accept that, yes, you of course, you know, like, I mean, the universe is so large, we can't be the only intelligent life. I mean, that's just common sense. But we had to fight an uphill battle for many decades yes so so i will i mean i hope i get more backlash man but that's just that's just gonna happen that's um, how it goes. UFO, right but what the people like bob lazar you, you know what happened to him they just thought he was crazy when he was talking about ufos they just laughed at him right but today people have accepted yeah i mean he was right and we he was just like way ahead of his time exactly um, yeah. So Praveen, it's 2024. What does this year hold for you? What are you up to? And how can people keep up with your work? Um, I have a, a bunch of temples that I have to go to. Uh, we're focusing in India and we're focusing in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're going to a bunch of different temples. Uh, we're trying to find uh, the true history um, of these ancient boulders like what were they trying to do and stuff like that so i have uh at least about 20 to 30 different temples that i have to visit and research in india and southeast asia and um and that's basically it so um um, i mean this is the part where uh, paul is asking me like what are you selling praveen are you selling a book or are you selling like a meditation course are you selling like uh, tours? Like Praveen Mohan is just uh, too dumb to do all that. So um, I'm just basically putting out all the materials I find online. It's just 100% free for you. If you just search for my name, Praveen Mohan, um, you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, you'll find all my videos, all my pictures just thrown out for free. Um, you can just just support me by just simply giving me a like, subscribe. Uh, more importantly, if you if it helps you, um, if it inspires you to do your own research, that would be fantastic. Because what we do need, like what's the need of the hour, um, is just more people with open minds. Like we, we don't want people who are like really dogmatic. Uh, we want people with an open mind just coming out and saying, okay, let's just explore this area. Let's, let's just try to understand our past much better, right? So according to scientists, what Homo sapiens start, what, like 200,000 years ago or something like that? Right. Mm-hmm. And we only have documented history of like 5,000 years. Yes. So, <laughs> so that's like, that's the percentage, right? So of history that we know about. So there is a huge portion that we don't know anything about. Um, so if we just get more people uh, rallying up for this cause, that'll be awesome. Uh, hopefully, man, I shape up and I write a book or something next year. So I feel I feel embarrassed to tell you that I got nothing to sell. 
That's wonderful. Praveen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. I think that's a great note to conclude on. It's been a pleasure. I hope you'll join us again sometime. But thank you today for joining us on The Fifth Kind. Oh, pleasure is all mine, man. I had a great conversation. Um, I hope that uh, your uh, viewers also uh, like this content, appreciate it. It was an absolute pleasure. I mean, this is the first time we're talking to each other, and I feel like I've known you for a long time. So thanks I a lot feel the for same. being so. Yeah, the feeling is absolutely so mutual. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, all the absolute best. Pleasure. All right. Thank you. Bye. If you enjoy our content here on Fifth Kind TV and would like to support our work, please would you consider subscribing to our new website, fifthkind.tv. Here we will have our full catalogue of material along with exclusive access to interviews and documentary content. Sign up today, become part of the community, become part of the conversation. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you there.